Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Elaine Martis reporting from Washington, D.C., where we're really excited to be here um, hosting a Facebook Live that is really focused on today's release of the AACR Cancer Progress Report 2019. I've got a fresh copy here in my hands, um, a really exciting document that we're pleased to be presenting today and, uh, and tomorrow as well to um, various legislative offices uh, across the federal government. Um, and, you know, in this year's cancer report, which, are, which is Cancer Progress Report, which is our ninth edition of the Cancer Progress Report, we're really excited to have a number of, I think, um, important milestones that we're representing out to the readers of the Cancer Progress Report. Um, this includes, for example, the fact that during the past year, our FDA um, in the United States approved 27 new treatments for cancer. Uh, this is a record number in that time frame. Um, and in particular, some of these, many of them actually are what we refer to commonly as molecularly targeted agents. So they go after specific cancer drivers and um, in effect have uh, in general, you know, fewer side effects, for example, than cytotoxic chemotherapies, and in many cases are highly effective for patients. We'll hear a little bit more about that today. Um, we also report in the Cancer Progress Report for this year, um, some very exciting statistics on survivorship. Um, in particular, that we are nearing the mark of having almost 17 million cancer survivors in the United States. Uh, a very large number compared to previous years. And I think, again, this is really reflecting out the fact that our development of new therapies, our improved understanding of the cancer genome and what drives cancer is really forging this link between matching patients to therapies and in very, very successful ways. And of course, what we hope for those survivors over time is that because of the increasing use of these molecularly targeted therapies, we'll have fewer side effects and better long-term survivorship experiences, if you will. And um, being at a pediatric hospital in particular for kids who we were able to cure of their cancers, we're very hopeful for that as a future uh, promise as well. So uh, there are many more things in the Cancer Progress Report. I won't bore you with all of the details. You can get one yourself, either in paper or available as PDF. Um, what I really want to do, and in, in light of the comments I just made about survivorship, is actually um, welcome and thank the uh, three cancer survivors that we have here today for the Facebook Live. Um, in particular, these uh, beautiful smiling faces you will also see in the pages of our Cancer Progress Report. And it's always really exciting, I think, for every year's um, CPR to actually put survivor stories in, to really personalize um, the aspects of new targeted therapies and what they're doing for patients in that particular way. And so it's really gratifying um, to be joined today by three of those faces from within the progress report, as I mentioned. Um, Eva Joseph, who's here just next to me, Keith Taggart, uh, who's here in the middle, um, and Tama Hargraves there on the other end from me. And we're going to um, spend a little bit of time now just talking to each one of them, um, hearing about their uh, cancer journey and understanding um, what they've uh, presented in the context of the Cancer Progress Report, how cancer research, which is a really core component of what the AACR promotes, especially in Washington, hoping for increasing uh, funding for the NIH and NCI um, in this um, important um, endeavor that we support, which is uh, cancer research that aims to help patients um, in a myriad of ways. So I'm going to um, now just sort of um, transition uh, to, to the patients that are here with me, and um, we're gonna hear about each one of them. So. Um, First off, uh, again, just closest to me is Eva Joseph. Um, Eva, tell us a little bit about your personal experiences with cancer and why you think cancer research um, has been important to the success that you've experienced in your cancer journey. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was diagnosed with cancer twice. The first diagnosis occurred when I was in California and um, was 2002. 
So the experience that I have for the first cancer treatment mm -hmm. and the one for the second is just very different. Okay. The, the first treatment, I was diagnosed with cancer, uh, stage four, not stage four, stage three mm -hmm. cancer. And I was treated with chemotherapy, mm -hmm. radiation, and of course, a mastectomy. Sure. And this resulted in a number of symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, not least of which, as far as I'm concerned, was I lost my hair. Right. So that was pretty traumatic. Um, but, you know, you, you, you go through what you have to to uh, survive. And then in 2014, after I thought I had cancer beaten, um, 10 years after I had been diagnosed with my first cancer. Mm -hmm. I started having shortness of breath. I started, I didn't have the ability to walk upstairs without help. And it soon became obvious that I needed to go to a doctor. Mm -hmm. I went to the doctor and they found a tremendous amount of fluid on my lungs. Okay. And uh, they, they withdrew that, sent me to x-ray and unfortunately, x-ray showed that I had two spots on my lung. And the diagnosis eventually, after treatment and tests and everything, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And I never knew anyone who lived through mm -hmm. stage four cancer, so right. I was scared. I was really afraid. I thought, I literally thought I got a month to live or something. I didn't even ask. <laughs> but then uh, one of my oncologists told me about um, a clinical trial and, and found me a position in the trial. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a study. Uh, you don't know whether you're getting the placebo or the real treatment. So... But I felt that was my best option at that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, at first, I, I did have similar symptoms, uh, side effects rather, um, to the one that I had in 2002. But the nausea, the vomiting, a loss of hair, all were just seemed to reiterate how bad my cancer was. You sure. know, it didn't tell me I was getting better. But as I continued the treatment, um, something happened. The immunotherapy kicked in, and I started feeling stronger. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of that, I am now able to do what I wasn't able to do before. Um, my husband and I moved to Portland about five years ago, and the whole purpose was we wanted to get to know the Northwest, take little side trips, you know, and um, get to know the people and the culture and everything. So we've been able to, to do that. What I want to say is how fortunate I am to have had the opportunity to receive immunotherapy. I don't think I would be here today without it. I want people to know that this new immunotherapy is providing hope for people like me who thought they had no chance to live and that it only came about because of cancer research and the hard work and money that supported it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a terrific story. And just to add a little bit of mm -hmm. um, uh, aspect to this, because I've done a lot of work myself in breast cancer, mm -hmm. and just wanted to highlight in particular that Eva was diagnosed with what we now consider to be one of the least tractable types of breast cancer, 
um, which is called triple negative disease. Right. It actually disproportionately affects uh, women of African American descent. Yes, it does. And um, as you pointed out, there's really one standard of care, which is what you got in 2002, and it's not you know a terribly pleasant thing to go through. So. Uh, multiple chemotherapy drugs at the same time, right. surgery that's usually radical mastectomy, um, and then typically a follow-up with radiation, sometimes, not always. Right. Um, and all of those things, as you pointed out correctly, can have pretty um, dire side effects, hard to get through. You're a bit unique in that most women um, with this type of diagnosis and this type of breast cancer actually relapse within about two years. So I think, you know, you were very, very fortunate to have that 10-year period between your first diagnosis and your second. Um, but obviously, once the second diagnosis with metastatic or stage mm -hmm. 4 disease comes around, typically then the survival is pretty truncated. You're right. Yeah. Right. So, so the other great thing about EVEN, as we're talking about in the Cancer Progress Report, one of the drugs that was FDA approved this year is a drug... Yes called with an almost unpronounceable yes. name. It, it um, is unpronounceable to me. <laughs> it's called, uh, let me give this a try, a okay. atezolizumab. How's that sound? <laughs> That's a mouthful, right? And, uh, and atezolizumab is now the first new therapy that's been approved for triple negative breast cancer in a very, very, very long time. So it's super so exciting. I had triple negative breast cancer at the right time. You did. You absolutely <laughs> did. And it's interesting, too, that you say that because I've talked to so many cancer survivors who, you know, have literally tried multiple therapies. You got lucky the second time you right. they picked the right one. Um, but, you know, in terms of the duration of benefit that they got from that, sometimes that gives them just long enough for a new drug to be approved that they then benefit from. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting dynamic about, you know, how much benefit we get and how long it lasts, because sometimes that can be just enough time. You know, um, you're right. I am very lucky because the life expectancy with someone with my type of cancer yes. is about 18 months. Yeah, that's exactly right. I have been here for four years. Yeah. So it's working. It's great. Yeah, that's a really wonderful story. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I think we'll see how this uh, conversation develops out, but we'll move on next to Keith Taggart. Um, who's here in the uh, in the center of us ladies. Um, lucky guy, you are. <laughs> um, so, uh, Keith, why don't you just give us a little bit of the history and, and your story that's also um, in our Cancer Progress Report. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I'm very happy to be here today, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my story. Um, I was uh, diagnosed in 2014 diagnosed with uh, 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 cancer in my saliva glands. Oh. Mm -hmm. I had a, a small tumor about the size of a pea in my cheek and really didn't know what it was, but they uh, uh, excised it and uh, biopsied it and it turned out it was cancer. Um, I really didn't, I didn't, wasn't that concerned about it because, you know, saliva gland cancer, you can easily remove the tumors as they pop up, which is exactly what they did. Um, the treatment was uh, removal of tumors, and also I was uh, scheduled for radiation. Uh, the highest doses of radiation, from what I understand, that they can give, it was uh, limited to my the left side of my head, and, and they did surgeries to take a margin of safety, is what they mm -hmm. call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I knew that the radiation was going to be pretty strong because they made a lead mouthpiece for me to right. protect my teeth and my gums and, and then the mask you know to keep my head in place while I was having the treatment the treatment didn't hurt very much anything like that so I still went about my work and scheduled the treatments in and with my job and and really wasn't that worried about it but the tumors kept developing as soon as I would go for follow-up visit with my doctor, mm -hmm. there would be more tumors. And it started to spread a little bit more and a little bit more. There were more surgeries and more surgeries to remove the tumors. Eventually, it moved into my lymphatic system. Mm -hmm. So then they started having surgery down in my neck and chest area. 
And uh, my doctor told me that we have hundreds of lymph glands in our neck, so I wasn't, still wasn't that concerned about it. <clears throat> but uh, uh, I had a really pretty large surgery where they took a lot of lymph nodes and some muscle from my shoulder mm -hmm. and went back for follow-up, and already I had more tumors that I could feel with my hand. And my surgeon, after, I don't know, 15, 16 surgeries or something, said, Keith, we're going to have to go in a different direction. I can't keep up with this with surgery. So um, he ordered all kinds of tests and scans, full body scans and everything, and came back. And I was very surprised to find out that it had metastasized and it spread into my lungs and my liver and my kidneys. And I had so many tumors that they couldn't be counted. Wow. Uh, they did testing again five days later, later and found out that my tumors had more than doubled in size in five days. My goodness. Wow. So he referred me to a chemotherapist who told me on my very first visit with her, she said, if you are willing to do chemotherapy, she said, I'll tell you it will make you very sick, but I can buy you another three or four weeks. And that was the first indication wow. to me wow. that I was going to die. And so uh, anyway, that same doctor told me, and this was a glimmer of hope, she said, there is a clinical trial. I've been getting these emails. They've been mm -hmm. e-blasting to me. The tri clinical trial administrator here is going nuts trying to find patients for this new drug. And I was reviewing your medical history and found one pathology report that ended that indicated NTREC3. It was positive for NTREC3 genomic fusion. Now, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> mm -hmm. But for me, it was a sign of hope that, you know, something I could hang on to. So I went back to my apartment. I was in Houston. I live in Oklahoma City. I've been mm -hmm. going to Houston for treatments. And <coughs> so anyway, uh, I uh, was trying to grapple with this death sentence, and about three or four hours later, I get a phone call from the administrator for the clinical trial. And uh, she asked me if I'd be willing to go through some tests to see if I would qualify. Okay. Well, absolutely, yes, yeah. I jumped on it. <laughs> and a week later, on the day that I was supposed to start chemotherapy treatments, um, I started the clinical trial instead for this new drug. Uh, the drug was, its gener generic term for it is larotrectinib, yep. and it is for this kind of fusion that I have. And being number six on this drug, I could still, when I started, I could feel the tumors in my neck and my cheeks. Mm -hmm. And on the fourth day, I could no longer feel those tumors. Wow. It happened that fast. Mm -hmm. Now, they did full body scans after the first four weeks in the trial. Yeah. And the doctor came back and told me that all of my tumors were gone, except one mm -hmm. in my lungs, which had shrunk by 65%. Okay, wow. So to me, it was an absolute miracle. I, uh, that was two and a half years ago, and I'm still in the clinical trial. Right. I've not had a new tumor since. Wow. I'm still taking this drug. The thing that's amazing to me, it's, it's a pill. I take twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. It has no side effects. <clears throat> I feel great. All of my cancer symptoms are gone. The fatigue, the weight loss, the, the vomiting, the diarrhea, all that's gone. I feel yeah. really good. All yeah. my vital signs are good. I'm, I don't miss any work mm -hmm. because of it. I'm kind of a career guy, and, and this has kept me very, very healthy. Yeah. The one thing that I will note is, I, looking back, if I could have started this drug right off the bat, I could right. have avoided all so the surgeries. surgeries. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, you know, the cancer <laughs> treatments up till now, are, they're, they kill tissue. You know, whether it's surgery, yeah. radiation, or chemotherapy, it's designed to kill. But this drug that I'm taking does not do that. So that all of my good tissue is, is living healthily, healthy. So... 
Uh, anyway, that's my story. So, yeah, congratulations, wow. really Peter. Great. Thank yeah, you. That really is good. just fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Yes, and so the so the drug that Keith mentioned, <laughs> Lertrectinib, was also one of these drugs that's been approved just in this past year. Um, it's it's been a remarkable drug, not only in clinical trials, not only for adults like you, but also for pediatric patients and. Um, it's also a bit remarkable, if you can let me be a little bit of a geek here for a second, in that it was, it's, it's gone through clinical trials in a tissue agnostic way. So whether you have salivary gland tumors or other tumors all the, uh, anywhere else in the body, as long as they have one of these NTRAC fusions that you mentioned, which is NTRAC, there are actually three versions, NTRAC 1, 2, and 3, they fuse into different other genes, but in every case, they drive cancer. And so these drugs have been uniquely designed to understand that fusion, that weird protein that results from two genes coming together that aren't supposed to be together normally. They're driving the cancer, and as you mentioned, just completely shut it down. So this is a remarkable approach. This is molecularly targeted therapy that we were talking about earlier, where if you have the target, you know, we have the arrow, basically. Mm. And um, wow. it's yeah. been really gratifying to see that this is really now the very first drug that's gone through this type of clinical trial, agnostic to tissue site, but effective in many tissue sites, where the FDA essentially has approved the drug, regardless of where your tumor is, if you have the target. So it's, it's really exciting for adults. It's exciting for kids who have sarcomas and other... Um, types of cancer that have these NTRAC fusions. We've sequenced some of these kids in our clinical studies at Nationwide Children's Hospital as well. And so it's been um, really exciting to, to hear about that story. I think the other thing that's, uh, that I wanted to point out um, just to finish up um, in terms of your case is how important it is for, and, and yours as well, and I'm sure we'll hear from Tama in this regard, how important it is for patients to consider and always ask an oncologist, is there a clinical trial that might help me? Um, if you look at the statistics you know, across the United States, only about 2% of patients actually enroll on clinical trials, hmm. which is too bad yes. because it yes. makes sense. The more patients we can get onto clinical trials, the faster we can accrue, that means reach the numbers that right. we need to reach, and the faster these drugs can, you know, hopefully be approved by the FDA for the benefit of all patients, um, because then they turn into what we normally refer to as the standard of care or second or third line therapy. Um, and over time, and we've seen this with um, drugs designed for lung cancers um, that I studied back in the mid-2000s in terms of their molecular targets, that over time, these actually become the first line. So we recognize that patients will do better if we identify that target up front at their primary diagnosis and we give them that drug. So it's, it's I think, an exciting time to, to see more and more examples of these targeted therapies and how they're working. So thank you very much for that story, Keith. Now we want to move on to Tama Hargraves down at the end of the table and just hear a little bit about you. I understand that you had uh, lung cancer and you're a 12-year survivor, so it's, I'm really excited to hear more having worked on those very early tyrosine kinase drugs um, back in the 2000s. Years. It'll be 13 That's years great. in November. That's great. So. I apologize for my squeaky voice, but at least I have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in 2006, I found a small lump um, on the side of my neck had no symptoms. My husband always was said I was probably the healthiest I'd ever been mm -hmm. and had a very proactive primary care doctor, which I think Great. is so important. Yeah. And he said, well, I don't think it's anything. You're too healthy, but let's biopsy it. Turned out stage 3B, non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. And so living where I live, um, we had two very good um, cancer centers, comprehensive cancer centers, UNC and at Duke. So I did some shopping for my treatment, and um, I was offered a clinical trial at UNC, and that's why I chose to do it. I got on the internet. My husband got on the internet. That's not. I don't always advise people to do that because it scares you. But in my case, I was able to kind of narrow down um, what I needed to do. At that time, they were not doing any testing 
for molecular markers or biomarkers or whatever they call it. Um, and so I just went ahead with what um, was a very aggressive um, mm. clinical trial. It had higher dose radiation, um, high dose chemo, and a targeted therapy drug, one of the very first that were out, was out there called Tarceva. Sure. And so um, it was a nine month clinical trial. Um, I didn't really have the reactions to the chemo that you were describing as far as being sick. Did lose my hair. It came back a beautiful gray later. <laughs> and um, the radiation is what got me because uh, it was 12% higher than normal radiation. Okay. Uh, what impressed me when they offered me this clinical trial was this, the um, oncologist actually sat down and hand wrote it out for me. Because when you're looking at all those papers and they're talking about all the things that you have to do right. or understand for a clinical trial, it's like, so he hand wrote it out for me and that was impressive to me. Also impressive, he brought a team into me, the radiation oncologist, the nurse navigator. They all came in to talk to me. I didn't have to go from person to person, which is also mm -hmm. a bonus. Um, I did pretty well with the, the test, uh, with the treatment. And in nine months, um, he took me into his office and he said, well, what was there is essentially gone. Mm -hmm. And so things are great. The nice thing about clinical trials is they keep a close eye on you. They do. Yes, yes. they do. So um, I went in constantly for checkups and scans and all of that. Three years later, I went out of remission. And guess where I went out of remission? In lymph nodes in my neck. And hmm. they now think it was because they did not radiate in that area. Indeed. Uh. But I did have one met to the brain by then. So I had one treatment of cyber knife, which is, to me, it was just totally non-invasive. It was impressive. They said, bring in your own CD. You can play your favorite music while you're having treatment. <laughs> and so after that, and since that time, um, I've been pretty healthy. Um, I do have um, compromised lungs because of the radiation, so I have to be careful of getting pneumonia and things like that. So I'll be watching this to see if it progresses. Um, I also um, I also have um, I don't really have fatigue from it, but I have to be more conscious mm -hmm. of the things that I'm doing because we have to keep our lungs healthy. Right. Uh, I now, I retired in 2014 as a speech pathologist in the public schools after 42 years. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, yay me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I um, volunteered for a program at UNC's uh, Cancer Hospital. It was new, called Patiently Navigators. Mm -hmm. It's now giving me an opportunity to work with thoracic and head and neck patients. One-on-one um, -on -one with the oncologist and the nurse navigators. And since that time, all of these years, 13 years later, the explosion of new treatments for lung cancer has yeah. just been overwhelming. The thing was, I found out I do have the EGFR mutation. They actually did test me for it three years later. Yeah. And my oncologist said, well, you don't have this one, you don't have this one, you don't have this one, but your EGFR. He said, but we knew that. And I'm like, well, how did you know that? He said, because you had all those awful symptoms yeah. of reactions, um, effects, side effects from the medication. I had the, the bad rash on my face. Mm -hmm. I had yeah. um, mm -hmm. some GI issues. But it obviously was part of that um, success story for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, um, and so I am right now, I'm, helping others and learning so much more about lung cancer because mine was such a limited knowledge at that point. Now it's just amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing what's yeah. going on. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful story. Congratulations. And, and thanks for sharing it with us. I think it points out some really interesting comparisons and, and contrast of the three stories that we've heard here, in particular that you were receiving a molecularly targeted agent combined with the standard of care at right. the time, so surgery, chemo, radiation. Right. That's oftentimes how we sort of add these new things into the mix so that we can compare them to the standard of care without that targeted drug. And so you were on the arm of the trial that got that drug, probably because they knew you had the mutation. Uh, but 
it, in your case, Eva, and, and in your case as well, Keith, you really just received a drug up front, you, you know, both in the metastatic setting, which is often where we start with new drugs, um, but, but in isolation and really maybe either in, you know, in comparison to the standard of care or in your case, you know, because NTRAC is such a unique target and your tumor type was actually quite rare that probably you just, you know, got on by virtue of having the right, um, the right alteration in your tumor genome. So it's really interesting how these different drugs play out, how they come into the reality of cancer patients. Um, and how, you know, clinical trialists sort of devise ways to um, introduce these in, in, a, in a setting where over time and again over a number of patients and based on the responses of patients, we get to the point where we can actually go to the FDA and say, you know, this is really uh, sort of the next best thing. And in some ways now, um, Tarceva isn't even first line anymore. They've now gone on to other drugs or... Yeah. And so wow. um, yeah. these patients who have very similar cases to mine are on totally different medications than I yeah. even. And yeah. I wasn't a surgery candidate at all, so um, I, see. I had too much lymph node involvement. So yeah. Um, yeah. it was a big surprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's really great. Um, and, and so it's, it's really wonderful to hear all of your stories um, and to hear and to try and emphasize again, whether it's basic research, which led us to immunotherapies like you benefited from, um, whether it's basic genomics, which is what I do in my day job that really reveals these molecular targets um, for different cancer types. You know, research is really what drives all of this. And um, having that fundamental understanding of what drives cancer allows us to design newer, uh, more effective drugs um, oftentimes in combination with other types of therapies. And I think over time is gonna help us to get away from some of these uh, more aggressive uh, challenges that we're, we're seeing. Even in the setting of radiation, and although it's not, I think, a topic in the Cancer Progress Report, there are new modalities mm -hmm. um, that are really becoming very, very exciting. In pediatrics, we've stayed away from high-dose radiation for our kids with brain cancer because we know in the developing brain it can have very dire consequences. Um, but newer forms such as Proton, and now a version of Proton called Flash, which you have to like just because of the name <laughs> alone, right? Um, really allows even adult patients, but also pediatric patients to get a single dose of very, very high dose radiation directed very um, precisely at the target, and to essentially not have to have that ever again. So it's a single shot, um, it's obviously being uh, used in a clinical trial setting now, but I think it's a really exciting development. Again, something that comes from very basic research, uh, you know, that's going to benefit patients just because somebody had the idea of what if. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a basic researcher, uh, you know, and a person who tries to apply that basic research um, in my day job uh, in, in the context of pediatric cancer, it's just so gratifying to see and to hear from all of you and to understand, you know, what that research has meant for your lives. So thank you for being with us today and for sharing your stories.